right. I can't believe I actually figured it out. I'm so not tech savvy. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. Yes, my husband's signaling to me, did you get on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that whole conversation was a little crazy about uh, religion and yoga and there's a whole other side of the practice that we can learn and grow from. Yeah. And I'm so glad I'm connected with. It was amazing. And, and we started talking because we were saying, like, I've been a health teacher for 16 years. And I was saying how helpful yoga, meditation, guided imagery, all those things have been for my student in a, um, you know, a poverty stricken school. And there right. you would never think that would be interested in it that have come back to me and said how helpful it was. So I. Yeah seen how much it helps and I'm not even a yoga instructor I just teach a few moves and teach some breathing right. like that so I can only imagine all the, the great things that you get to see yeah. with what you do yeah I mean I've been teaching for 10 years so I've been doing it for a while and probably about three years or so ago I really got into the trauma-informed aspect of it to see I have so many people coming after my classes and sharing with me, um, you know, what, what is it? Why am I crying? What is this I'm feeling? And telling me all of these things that was going on in their life. And at a certain point I felt like, you know, I really needed to educate myself because people were coming to me and I wanted to make sure I was helping, not adding to it. And uh, so done, I've done a couple of different trainings and, it's changed everything about um, my teaching, my practice, my own healing, my, the way I approach my own therapy, my own um, spiritual bump in the roads type of thing, you know? And um, it's really, it's real, for me, life changing. But what if we can do, if we can just take a moment to um, just talk about the difference between, say, and I hate to use the word a regular yoga class, but um, a regular class and say um, a class with someone who uh, the teacher is has some sort of trauma sensitive or trauma informed training. So let me just let me just stop you. Yeah. I want to hear this. Can everyone hear OK? Because on my side, uh, you're a little bit quiet. I don't know if everyone can hear OK. Um, Do I this up or should I? I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if, to, to, if you can speak a little louder or move a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm having a little trouble. I don't know if anybody else is. Um, but I definitely would like to hear your background. Okay. So it gets a little bit better. Oh. And then definitely I want to hear the difference between the different types of yoga and how, how that is effective. Yeah. So um, the reason why I got into yoga is in my 20s, I started having a lot of anxiety attacks, panic attacks. Um, for me, anxiety attacks would be lasting for a long period of time, a panic attack. It, for my definition, is the rush and then just uh, it's the more physical at the moment, but then the anxiety would be like walking around like this, you know, um, and a couple of different depressions. And after my third child, my husband said to me, you know, why don't you try yoga? Because I was a little twitchy, a little like on edge. And, um, you know, I started practicing at home. Then I went for a teacher training and... I, you know, been practicing and teaching since then. And it's really, you know, really come into the whole science behind it. And that's what we, what I was trying to say in that dialogue when we first met was that there's so much more to it than say the religious aspect. There's a whole different science of a, a way to approach yourself, a way to approach a per, another person, a situation, how to stay present, um, and that, you know, and I just had a, a yoga teacher tell me the other day, and I just love that she said this. In the eight path of, um, eight limb path of yoga, asana, the physical practice, what we do on the mat, is only one of the limbs. And she said to me, that's my weakest limb. She lives and breathes yoga. And I just thought, wow, that's, yeah, that's it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's I got into it. It's all about going with the flow. And I, and I know for myself, when the, some of the most stressful events in my life, yoga has been the go-to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I just remember in college working full-time, going to school full-time, and I would do yoga on a Saturday, and I would all of a sudden feel, I would do a turn, all of a sudden like, there'd be a tear like going down my face, and I would say, 
oh, I didn't realize I was holding on to that, whatever it was. Or um, when I was having health issues and I was really into all this physical exercise and the, the doctor said, you need to slow down on the, the really heavy physical stuff. I said, well, can I do yoga? I need something to deal with the stress that I'm, that I'm noticing. And they said, yeah, you can, do, you can do yoga. So that was my release when I wasn't able to do anything else. And, and I mean, it helped me through some of the worst, the worst times of my life. So I'm so, I strongly believe that it is, is really helpful. And, I, and I, I'd love to hear the difference between the one that's specifically focused for trauma versus the regular yoga. Now I'm gonna completely generalize. So uh, I'm just, you know, and when I say regular, I mean, yoga, the, the physical aspect of yoga is such a wide umbrella. Um, you can move through on your breath in a strong vinyasa class where you're just constantly moving to the point where you can hold a pose in restorative yoga for 15, 20 minutes or so. And there's a million different places in between to go to. So I'm, I'm generalizing quite a bit. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I'm still having a little bit of trouble, but if everyone else can hear you, I, I'm, then I'm fine. All right, I'll go a little closer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in a regular yoga class, it's, it's a lot of um, directives, like um, lift your foot, place your foot here, uh, turn in this direction. Um, it's a lot of directions on how to do things. Mm. In, a tra uh, in a trauma-informed or a trauma-sensitive yoga class, it's more about noticing. Notice how this feels if you do this. When you're ready, if you'd like, put your foot here. Um, for me, when I teach it, is there's a lot of flowing back and forth in and out of um, a pose before you actually hold it. Because this way you can kind of just move in, move out, move in, move out until you feel ready. Because with trauma, with um, trauma survivors, dis being disempowered is such a huge part of trauma. Um, where you don't have control of your body, you don't have control of your choices, you don't have control of what sometimes feels like anything in your life. So when you come into a, a practice that is asking you to be mindful, then giving you that opportunity to make those decisions, to make those choices, that's where the trauma-informed part comes in, where, you know what, I don't feel comfortable doing this, and I don't feel the pressure to have to do it. Um, and so in, in that kind of environment, you give lots of different options. If you feel comfortable, you can hold your leg here. If that doesn't feel great in your body or your body doesn't want you to, um, you don't really feel like doing, you don't have to even give a reason. You just say, if that doesn't feel like something you want to do, try this, try that. Notice how this feels. It, even to the point of where, where, how you walk around the room. You know, um, in, in one of my classes, I have to walk around to lower the light for Shavasana. So Shavasana, at the end of our practice, you lie down traditionally on your back with your palms up. You can close your eyes. And in my classes, we go from a meditation to a Shavasana, and they go when they're ready. And Shavasana can be on their back, on their belly, on their side, however they feel comfortable in that, you know, Space on their mat that they're inhabiting. And so when I walk around the room, whether I'm five feet away or 20 feet away from the next person, it's a, a very large room, I'll hug the wall because this way, if they're lying down and their eyes are closed and they hear footsteps coming by them, it doesn't trigger. So it's, it's, it's so much involved um, how it's changed the way I teach my choices of words, where I place myself, asking permission, and, and all of that. So that's kind of the difference between, I mean, there's so many differences, but that's a big difference between a regular and, a, and again, you know, to a trauma-informed. And you can take that idea, like, I don't necessarily go out, like, my classes are not specific trauma-informed classes. But with the statistics of the people who are being traumatized, these days, right? Um, it's overwhelming. And trauma is such a subjective word. So what traumatizes me might not traumatize you or might not traumatize the next person. Or what does it for you might not do it for me. So we don't know. So we just really need to be cautious, you know, and hold space. And I can talk about it forever. So just shut me up when you need to. <laughs> no, I, I love 
love it. And I mean, and that's the reality is that, you know, with the clients that you work with and, and the people that follow me and, and that I work with, I mean, trauma mm -hmm. is just so ingrained in our society that we don't even realize almost that it's trauma. Like, oh, we're just supposed to deal with it. Oh, that's just how life is. But the reality is that we need to learn positive coping skills. And so much of the time, I find that women, and this is not a dig against men at all, but women that, that I've met are putting themselves on the back burner and they're oh, yeah. there on the back burner. So they might feel like they need help and they're not able to voice it. They're not able to go out and ask for it. And they don't even know what to ask for because right. it's something they've dealt with their whole life and they don't even know how to deal with what's going on for them. And a lot of times too, they don't even, and myself included, don't realize that something is a violation because we just accept it, you know, oh, that's just the way it is. Well, no, that's not okay, mm -hmm. you know, um, but that comes back to that whole idea of being disempowered. And when you're disempowered, that can, um, you know, on, a, on a, a, a neuropathic wavelength, you know, it changes the way your brain works. It, it, um, we're already hardwired to look for the, you know, the negative because it's for our survival, you know, going back to like caveman times, um, we need to survive, right? And we still have that hardwiring. So instead of like the saber tooth tiger coming at you, it's your to-do list or it's a traumatic event or it's the boss who's yelling at you and we just stay stuck and, I think the idea of mindfulness and the science of yoga helps us rewire our brain to say, wait a minute, that's not right. That's not okay. I'm worth it. I, you know, I am empowered and I deserve. Um, and that's what we really kind of work with, with our classes um, and the, and the men and women, because I have both in my classes. Um, so it's, like you said, it's not a woman's thing. Um, you know, it's a person thing. It's a human thing. And, and really, that's what drew me into the whole thing. Do you, do you want to take a, a moment to just kind of do um, a meditation, like a grounding kind of thing? So people can kind of get an idea of um, the idea of coming in and noticing your body. Um, okay. So, so what we'll do, if it's okay with you, is that... Um, I'll lead it and people can either participate, they can watch whatever they want to do. And then, you know, we'll take a few minutes and just kind of notice different things. And then we can talk about that or anything else. Okay. Sounds like a All right. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, let's just come to a comfortable seat. Like uh, for just an example, I'm sitting on the floor right now. So if you're sitting on a chair, if you are sitting on a couch, wherever you are, see if you can just start to notice a little bit of comfortability in your body. And you can watch the screen, you could close your eyes, you can take your eyes down towards the floor, wherever it feels comfortable for you to start to ask yourself to draw yourself in. So we'll begin by just trying to find an anchor into the moment, into the room, or into our bodies. So while you're here, see if you begin to notice something. And please know that if I ask a question, there's no right or wrong answer. It, there just is. It just is. There's no rights, there's no wrong. So start to notice, if you can, maybe a sensation. And that sensation could be your palms on your thighs, it could be your sit bones, the base of your pelvis on the floor, or your feet, or your back on the cushion of the couch or the chair. Maybe it's the rise and fall of your belly. Maybe it's the air moving in through the nose and then back out. Maybe it's the sound of my voice. So as you bring yourself to some sort of awareness to what's happening at this very moment, 
See if you'd like to bring some movement into the spine. So here I'm just going to be making some circles with my spine. Going forwards and back, you could either match that or you can do your own movement. Maybe they're big circles or small circles. Maybe your shoulder feels like it wants to come in or the other one. Notice if your chin is dropping down. If part of your focus is on your breath, see if your breath is moving with your movement, right? Is your movement following the breath or is your breath following the movement? Maybe you want to begin to roll yourself forward, drawing your shoulder blades together, reaching your heart forward. And then on your exhale, floating it back, tucking your chin. Okay, so we all have different rates of breath. We all have different rhythms. So on your inhale, if you'd like, roll yourself forward, opening your spine in the front. And then on your exhale, roll it back, tucking the chin. So as you move through this, okay, See if you can ever so slightly come back here and there to your anchor. What is it that's keeping you to this moment? That sensation. And then slowly bring yourself back to stillness. And when you're ready, if your eyes are closed or down, slowly lift them up. Maybe take a deep inhale through the nose, letting it out through the mouth. And then just settle back into the seat. And bring your gaze back to the screen whenever your body's ready. Okay. Yeah, so that's how I try to begin all of my classes, whether we go into a full athletic vinyasa class or we do, um, we just did a chair yoga class the other day. So it's, it's that idea of, um, in uh, I'm not a yoga therapist, but in yoga therapy and in trauma-informed yoga, the, um, the, the word is interoception. It's coming into that feeling of what our body actually feels like. When we turn, what does that twist feel like? When we roll forwards and backwards, if we start to notice things, that's interoception. And that's something we lose as, uh, traumatized people. So slowly bringing that back and becoming aware of that then sets off this whole um, chain of reaction of really good neuron uh, firing in the brain and new pathways coming and then really saying, hey, wait, what is this mindfulness stuff I've been hearing about? And Maybe I can do that. And it really starts to bring that healing path uh, online, so to speak. Yeah. And that's huge because I was thinking before, you know, there's there's the trauma bonding that so many people go through where they're, you know, they're in a relationship that is traumatic. They're mm -hmm. back and forth. There's the drama. There's all these things that go on. And people and myself included, I was there too. We get trapped in there. We get stuck in that that cycle of you know, are they coming? Are they going? Are they going to be angry? Did I say the wrong thing? All these different things. And that's trauma. I mean, that's stuff that normally you should not have to deal with in a healthy relationship and to be able right. to connect with, because that's one of the things, you know, when I wrote my book, Being Loved Shouldn't Hurt, it was the moment that I realized that really love should not hurt, that that was a changing pivotal moment for me. Because before that, love meant trauma pretty much it meant anxiety and stress and discomfort and all of those different things because it's yeah. what i was used to and the ability to reconnect to what love really is and really feel that sensation in your body and oh right. here is what it feels like and it's not that like nervous anxious feeling and to really become one like you said and that's what i love you said before about really feeling through your body we mm -hmm all of our gut instincts that our body is telling us because we're trying to deal with 
the trauma that we're experiencing. Right, right. Yeah, and and then and then those that fulfills our expectations. Oh wait, no, love is supposed to be drama and trauma and ups and downs and and roller coasters. And like you said, it's not. And when we start to feel our coming back into our body, it it's and not everyone comes back into their body first, but in that sense it then starts off that chain reaction of, wait a minute, I'm feeling something here. I feel my muscles and I feel that um, not in my belly. What is that about? Wait, that doesn't feel like it's helping me. And then how to learn to um, talk yourself down or out of those emotions. And, and one of the things that I learned in my own journey that um, I'm big in the science like and I, I can I, can I just give you an example way back when um, I think I was in my late 20s when I had my first anxiety attack and when I went to therapy I, I literally drove myself to the emergency room um, and they're like nope you're not having a heart attack you're having a panic attack I'll go to a therapist and I went to this therapist and she was wonderful. And I left there with a notebook this thick of all the biological changes that happen in your body that um, when you're having anxiety. And anxiety doesn't always come hand in hand with trauma, but it's there, it's present. Um, high stress, toxic stress. So we don't, we, when, when we talk about healing ourselves with yoga, um, it's not just trauma, right? It's not just you have to have been traumatized to be to get something out of a trauma informed yoga class. It's not. We have levels of toxic stress um, that have just manifested as these huge um, knots in all of these places in our body. So when any and anything would happen, when my heart would race, when I would sweat, or um, like I would freak out, like oh my god, this is it. Uh, you know, um, and I remember reading, and this is what clinched the science part for me. I remember reading that when you have anxiety, when you're in a really high stress state, your vision can change. Like you, you actually lose some of the peripheral vision because you're focusing, because you're moving right into fight or flight. So if you think back to caveman times, you know, saber tooth tiger is coming at me. I can't really be distracted by what's you know oh a tree right you know i have to like tune all that out and focus on the saber tooth tiger um and decide like right there and then instinctively fighting or flighting right uh, uh, uh yeah fighting and when i realized when i read that oh that's why my vision changed i was like that empowered me so much like oh my god that's what's happening oh that's nothing and then all of a sudden i disempowered that aspect of it and by doing that I rose a little bit so I've really embraced the the science behind um, what our bodies really do and the one thing that um, in my that and like I said that was in my 20s when I learned that um, a term that I really hold on to now is called um, window of tolerance and um, it's like this right and I think of it like a stream and we're just floating down the stream and when we're good in our relationships and when everything is like uh, balanced, you know, it doesn't mean we don't go up and down. It's just, we don't go up and down. Right. Um, you know, you're in that window of tolerance. You're just doing this. And then um, when I start to talk about something that triggers me or when I see it in a student or a friend or whatever, and you see them, they, you know, they're moving out, they're going onto the shore now. And that's where, you know, that's the danger zone, the up here and the down here. And so when I feel that in my body, when I feel that anxiety coming in or that anger for no reason, like I'm just angry, that's up here. I, I'm like, oh, I'm out of my window of tolerance. I got to bring myself back in, you know, and just that, like, almost like a mantra brings me back down because we learn those cues for ourselves as we begin to heal. Yeah, and so. that's what I think is so important is because I think that when you are so used to the trauma, this mm -hmm. this is normal. So, yeah, and and it's yeah. what it's what you're used to, and so that's what it, it's not comfortable, but you're comfortable in the discomfort. It's 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 what you know, 
And you know, now that I'm on the other side, and I do, I'm in the same thing. I, I keep it here. And when I start to feel myself go above, I'm like, all right, what do I have to do? What self care do I have to do? Who do I have to talk to? And I start right. to feel it. I can sense it. I know that I have to set a boundary or share a feeling or you know what, whatever it is. And right. that's now very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable when I start to feel myself get out of that zone of the, the flow. They call, you know, in yoga, you call it the flow. So when I get out yeah. of the flow, I feel it immediately. And I want to try to see what I can do to make it better. Where before, yeah. I would feel that craziness and it was like, well, that's just the way it is. And I would just- Right, hey, it's acceptable. It's yeah. like it was, you just wrote it. There was, and it, it felt like there was nothing you could do about it. Right, right. So there are some things that I do that I would like to share when I am moving out of that um, window of tolerance. Because a, a lot of people, and this is one of the things that I've learned, is a lot of people say, oh, um, meditate, right? Meditate, let it go, right? Like, so sitting on, I'm sitting on my meditative pillow right now. And there are times when I avoid this thing like nobody's business because I am not, I know sitting on it will re-trigger something. And then there's times when um, I long for it. So um, what I would like to do, if it's okay, like, you know, I'm not sure if this is where you want to go with it, but um, so some of it's yogic and some of it's um, just things that I've learned throughout the years that kind of just fall into place um, of things to do when you're starting to go up here. And just because I'm talking about it doesn't mean I never go up here or never go down here. I do. I just try to choose and see when that right time is, right? If I'm having a conversation with somebody and somebody is talking to me after a class, and I'll just use yoga as an example, after a class and somebody is talking to me about something and I can feel myself, you know, being drawn in, I'll be like, you know, in my mind, window of tolerance, and then know that, okay, that's something I need to deal with. And then I do, I go into the self care, I'll call a friend, I'll talk to my husband, who is a friend too. Um, I'll talk to my therapist. I'll, um, the one thing I don't really do, and um, I wish I did, is I'm not a journal writer. And people find so much solace in that, it's just not my thing. And we have to be able to say, you know, Okay, like I would love to have all that, right? But not my thing. Um, because we see those um, uh, those memes on social media, meditate, let it go, you know. Um, I just saw one recently, meditate, don't medicate. And I was really upset by that because no, <laughs> you know, it's like judgment, you know. Everybody's different. We need to take care of ourselves and whatever way is best for us, you know, like what is for you might not be for me, just like trauma. Right. Mm -hmm. So like what traumatizes you might not traumatize me and vice versa. What works for you might not work for me. So it's finding those things that work. Yeah. yeah. So what are, so what are some things that you use when you're feeling so, that so things that I do when I start to feel anxious? Um, and this comes back to the idea of um, the first one, we have a, a, a tenet in yoga that's ahimsa, non-harming. And we think um, a lot, when people first come to the science of yoga, they'll think non-harming um, with your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. And, and a lot of times we perceive it outwardly, right? I'm not going to talk negatively to that person, even if they cut me off on the side of the road or they're telling me what to do and I don't agree with it. I'm going to, you know... I'm going to give light and love, right, you know, and, and do that. But what we don't think about a lot of times is non-harming for ourselves. So much self-talk is, is so negative and that if you actually put that voice on someone externally, you would never accept that behavior from someone else. Mm -hmm. Yet that's the voice we're living with and that's the voice that's talking to us. So that first realization of is like, hey, you know, I can't talk to myself like that, Ca trying to catch ourselves. And, you know, doesn't mean you're not going to do it. It just means that we're going to catch ourselves and maybe we're not going to do it as frequently. And then when we do do it, we go, mm, no, you know, non-harming to myself, you know, in our own thoughts and our own words and our own deeds for ourselves, not just externally. 
So that's one of the realizations. Um, one of the things, and I learned this off of a TV show years ago, um, is counting backwards. So when you're in, when you're in fight or flight, when you're really experiencing um, in, in yoga, that would be like your, uh, not in yoga, but in your nervous system, that's your sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight, you're like, oh my gosh, the adrenaline, the cortisol, everything is racing. Um, when that saber toothed tiger is in front of you, your prefrontal lobe your, of your brain, your, um, the logistical part, the part that's very rational, the step-by-step -step, kind of turns offline and the instinctive part comes on. Right, you gotta run. You gotta you gotta fight. You gotta run away. Think about like a stove. You put your hand on a hot stove, right? Instinctively, you pull it up. You don't sit there and go, hmm. Now this is hot. When it's hot, I should lift my hand up, right? You don't really go through a thought process there. You instinctively pull it up. So that's what we're really doing. So counting backwards from um, with an odd number brings that logistical part of your brain back online. So take like a go to hundred, count back by three, right? Because you have to think about that, um, and don't always do threes. You have to switch it up because pretty soon going back by threes will be rote. So you need to go to fours or sevens or sixes or whatever. So it's something you have to think about. Um, the alphabet backwards, um, not forwards, because we can sing it in our sleep, right? So something that's going to bring that prefrontal lobe back online, where you have to uh, turn down the reptilian part of the brain, the instinctive part of the brain, and bring back online the thought process. So that's one thing that, that I'll do. Um, using sensations. Um, so uh, in Kundalini Yoga, which is such a beautiful um, practice of yoga, um, and I admire it. I don't teach it. It's well out of my wheelhouse. There is um, a meditation where they cross on their fingers. Um, Sata Nama, right? And it has its own meaning. But you can use that same sensation to um, bring you back to the present. I am right here. So you can press down, which is going to bring another sense online, right? You see your touch. I am right here. And brings you back to the present moment, the feeling of your fingers pressing in, whether you use your nail or your finger bed, whatever it might be, um, pressing in is going to bring you back online as well. So those are some of the things um, that we can do when no one's noticing. Like say we're at work and you're feeling anxiety because your relationship is going up and down and you don't know what to expect when you're getting home and you start to feel it, right? It's rising and you're sitting at your desk. These are things that you can do in your mind. On, no, no one has to see your hands and that you can do it and no one even knows because no one really knows unless it hits 10 that you might be having a panic attack. So no one will know that you're bringing yourself down. So those are things we can do in the privacy of our own little space, you know? There are some, um, I wrote it down, so I need to just look at my list. Is that okay? Am I going on too long? Oh, no, been, perfect. I'm so passionate about this that it's like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, should you be quiet? <laughs> no, I love it because this, I mean, this is so, like I said, in, in my groups, this is what we talk about all the time is, is that, that, that trauma and how to move how to move past it because what happens is the the pain starts and then we pull back from it and you yes. know, say well what do I do I'm in so much pain I don't yeah. know what to do and I keep going back to what's causing me pain even though I know I shouldn't but I don't know how to get out of this cycle so I I mean all of these suggestions are just so great and I love the fact of just being reminded to get back into the thinking part of our brain because that's what we go into that's automatic mode because we do right yeah and I, you think about like a um a toxic relationship whether with a, if it's a partner with a, a child with a friend a parent whatever it is we often don't think about our responses we just automatically go do it because that's what we did so going back to that thing that we did in the meditation the idea of feeling into our bodies and noticing and 
just on that physical level noticing helps us go into the mental idea of noticing, hey, wait a minute, you know, that really wasn't what I wanted to do, yet I'm doing it anyway. Um, and then what? And then when we're knee deep in it, so to speak, and it's building, these are some of the things that we can do to maybe um, take us down in that moment so we can then deal with it uh, in the right atmosphere. I'm a big proponent of therapy. I think everyone should be in therapy. Um, I don't think you need uh, a mental disorder or a mental illness to be in therapy. We all, my opinion, we all need that uh, outside voice to help us see, to look back at ourselves, to mirror back and see ourselves. Um, yeah, I don't know why I said that, but I, I'm such a proponent of therapy. I think it's the best me, thing ever. Me too, me too. And as a coach, I mean, that's what I even say to people. Yeah. Coach, I'll say, hey, I'm a coach, but go see a therapist because a therapist will get to the root and help you with the coach. We kind of bring you to where you need, like, we kind of help give more, a little bit more advice and a little bit more pushing where therapists are just kind of, you're sound right. and they're, they're so supportive and so helpful. I mean, therapy was pivotal for me in, in my, in my healing. Yeah. And I, by no means discount um, coaching either because it's all what we need at the moment. You know, it's all what we need at the moment. Um, I just don't want to put out there that uh, I'm not one of those people that yoga heals everything. It's a doorway. It's a gateway. It's a beautiful practice that is part of the recipe part of, to yeah. help live, uh, um, a, a life of well-being. It's mm -hmm. part of the recipe, as is coaching, as is therapy, as is nutrition, as in communication and friendship and whatever other people might need, you know? Um, so I definitely want to do a breathing exercise with um, all of us. Um, do you want to do it now? You want me to add some more things? You tell me. Breathing exercise sounds perfect. Okay. All right. So the reason why we'll do this, and again, I'm that person who wants to know why. Like, it, to me, it ingrains it more. So if there's somebody watching that isn't that type of person, give me like 30 seconds to just explain it. Um, but so we have the, the part of our um, automatic, uh, autonomic nervous system, um, the sympathetic part, the parasympathetic part. And I mentioned before, the sympathetic part is the fight or flight. I mean, it does a lot of different things, but for this purpose, that's what it's for. The parasympathetic is our, um, what, for lack of a better word, our rest and digest. It's that part of our nervous system that chugs along when we don't have to think about it. You know, it's just doing all the things that need to be done to keep us balanced. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're in, in anxiety, we're in fight or flight, we're all the way up there. You know, we're in the sympathetic. And... Um, so there's a breathing exercise, which our exhales uh, contribute to elongating or staying time in the parasympathetic, that resting part of our nervous system. Our inhales, did I say exhales? Our exhales are there. Our inhales are the sympathetic. Our inhales, if you think about it, of a breath, you're, you know, that's getting you up. On your exhales, they're getting you down. So in this breathing exercise, we start, and we're going to start at matching our breath, and I'll count to three. Um, and then we start to add the exhales on. And adding those exhales will then keep us longer in the rest and digest part. Sometimes, and, and if we, we can actually pause in after the exhale, which then elongates that parasympathetic part as well. So let's, let's do it. Let's come to our comfortable seat. Again, whatever's comfortable for you. Um, legs extended, feet on the floor, chair, couch, whatever, whatever's working, okay? If you'd like, place your hands onto your thighs. And just as we did before, you can follow the screen and watch me. You can close your eyes. You can take your gaze down wherever you feel most comfortable in your space at the moment. So as we do this, if it feels comfortable and safe for you, if it feels right, begin to notice your breath. Okay, so on for this exercise, I will be guiding the breath. At any point you're like, no, this is not for me. 
lift your gaze, open your eyes, move around a little bit, come out of it and try to re-come back to that homeostasis, that balanced feeling. But if you feel comfortable, follow along. So let's inhale together. Two, three, exhale. Two, three. Inhale, two, three. Exhale, two, three. Inhale, two, three. Last one even. Exhale, two, three. Inhale, two, three. Adding. Exhale, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three. Exhale, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three. Slowing and adding. Exhale. Two, three, four, five. Inhale, two, three. Exhale, two, three, four, five. Last one. Inhale, two, three. Exhale. Two, three, four, five. Now let your breath just flow naturally how it wants to flow. And when you're ready, if you'd like to lift your eyes, open your eyes, or take your gaze back. Yeah, so slowing down those exhales begins to slow down the body. So just keep in mind with something like that, we all breathe at our own paces. So not sitting with you and being able to see the rise and fall of your belly, is it's a little harder to gauge the inhales and exhales as you speak them. So that kind of exercise really comes to the ownership of the participant. So if you go to do that on your own, trying to elongate, when you're ready to turn, and I often think of it like an, uh, an oval, when you're ready to turn into the next one, the exhale, come when you're ready. And each one might be a little different, but the idea is to elongate the exhale, which then brings us into that quieter side of the nervous system. And if you're doing it in a group of people, to get let go of the judgment of trying to match the person next to you. Because again, we all breathe differently, right? So that is one of my favorites. Um, to like, let that exhale go, let it go longer, let it go as long as I can, as slow as I can. Because that really does wonders for me. Like I can feel it with my heartbeat, my blood pressure, my anxiety, um, toxic stress, levels of stress. You know, the kids are driving me crazy, <sighs> you know, and it really helps whether you're, you know, uh, in a little thing or a big thing, you know. And I like I need, you're focusing on it. You're, you have to come back into your body because you're focused yeah. on breathing. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I know when I'm in the, the, the mix of anxiety times, breath work is very hard. So that might not be for the moment when you're feeling a little disempowered. You know, a lot of times with anxiety, um, you're breathing here, right? You're obviously not breathing in your neck, but it feels like it, right? Or in, de if in, in depression, it feels like you're not breathing. So it's finding that right time. And that's why I say yoga is part of the recipe, because that's a beautiful, it, it's called pranayama. Um, that's breath work. It's a beautiful pranayamic exercise, but finding the right place for it 
and how much of it was always something, a lesson for me to learn when it's appropriate for me and when it's not appropriate, you know? Yeah. That's excellent. So do you, should I add some more stuff? Yeah, some more ideas or? Yeah, whatever, if you, whatever stuff it is. By the way, if anybody is watching, I know we've, we have a lot of people that have come in and, and you know, said hello. So sorry that we're not saying hi back. Um, but if you have any questions, please ask questions because we're, you know, we want to give you whatever is useful for you so that you yeah. have your toolbox of things so that when you are feeling anxiety, when you are feeling overwhelmed, when you're not really sure where to turn, you can like, you know, look in your little toolbox and be like, oh, okay, I'm going to try, yeah. you know. And I love to say that because I literally have a visual my toolbox is always on my right side, a little bit further behind. Me. Like I, that's my, that's another tool. Like to say, okay, what's in my toolbox? I'm ready to kill someone. What's in my toolbox? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm like, what am I going to do now? And it really is using all those different sense, your imagination, to come back to helping root you down. Um, I have to put my glasses on because I can't read my list. <laughs> so okay, so moving any kind of movement oh okay so this i i use a lot for those of you um who are watching or will be watching um who know me know that um i had started the yoga program in the Pat patchogue medford school district um and this is something i did with the, um the individual classes when i would go in as like a guest speaker or um which was a little bit extra than the actual part of the program. So we had our eight classes that I saw um, every single class eight times. And then uh, uh, there were times when a teacher would say, can you come into my class? Or we're dealing with this. Can you come in and give us some ideas? So this is one of the ideas that we always talked about doing. So when you start to feel that sense of disassociation, when, um, and, I, and I use from my own experience, that feeling of floating out of your body, right? You're, you're got so much going on and you just almost feel like I'm not here, you know, I, I'm here, but I am not here. Um, or it doesn't have to be to that extreme, but orienting yourself to your, to the place that you're in, the room you're in. Um, and this is a big thing. When we start to disassociate on whatever level, we lose sight of um, the present moment. So another tool like counting back from threes, would be to look around the room and you know count three blue things or I will find five red things. Um, the last time I was telling a student of mine to do this, we were in a room that had a ton of signs on it. And I said, you know, maybe look to spell your name in the sign. Can I find an S? Can I find a U? Can I find an E? Right? Um, bring yourself back in. Does the person you're talking to Hey, what colors is that person wearing? You know, what color are those person's eyes? Start bringing yourself back into that present moment by using that logical part of your brain again, orienting yourself there, right? Um, that is a big one. So with the kids, we would, I would say, um, what's on the door? Name five things on the teacher's desk. So say you're in a meeting and you're feeling it, right? You're, you, you know, um, I was just reading something and I used the example of a saber tooth tiger. The person was using an example of a bear and she said, um, it was an example of an alcoholic parent and she was talking about fight or flight with the bear coming at you. And then she said, well, what happens if the bear comes home every night from the bar? You're in constant fight or flight. So same idea. You're in a meeting and you're worrying about what's coming home, you know, what you're coming home to, um, and you feel that stuff going on. Uh, you know, if there's a desk, count the different objects on the desk, or see if you can mentally name all the different things. Can I find a pencil sharpener? Can I find uh, an eraser? Can I find a stapler? Whatever it is. And whatever tool that works for you to bring that prefrontal lobe back online, mm -hmm. that logistical part. And these are all different ways to do that, but that's what we're trying to go for. So by giving different examples how to do it, one thing might resonate with one person, 
one thing might resonate with somebody else. In the classroom, we did what's on the door. Do you remember what's on the door? The door was closed. You know, what's on the teacher's desk? What's on the person across the room from you? You know, what are they wearing? That kind of thing. That one I love. That Because we, you know, we can all, if we think about it, we're all in a room. We could all find something to count, right? Um, let's see. Uh, and like I said, um, education for me has been wonderful. Reading, finding out why my body does something empowers me and disempowers the anxiety or disempowers the, um, the uh, whatever that saber tooth tiger is. And, and to know that, that we're okay. Like if we can't meditate, who cares, right? I, sometimes I'll call it exploratory concentration because that sounds cool and that's what I'm doing because I'm exploring while I'm trying to concentrate on what's happening in my body, you know? And it gives me the freedom to say, so what, I'm not meditating. I'm a yogi who's not meditating, but I'm looking at it in a different way. I'm just concentrating on the moment and staying in my window, whatever works. Yeah. And that's so important. It's really about finding what's comfortable. I mean, it, it, it all comes down to that. What's comfortable yeah. for you and not, not the discomfort, not that feared comfort, but like, but that real genuine comfort calmness within your body how, how can you bring more of that into your life yeah and really it's you know it, it sounds so simple but just embracing it's okay you know and oh here's another one um this is my favorite one and one of my therapists who I just love she retired moved away um was a yogi so she was great when that I went to her when my first depression set in and she was fabulous. And the fact that she was a yogi as I was starting on my yogic journey was wonderful. And she gave me, um, so we have what's called the yoga sutras and it's kind of like the tenets for yoga. It describes the eight limb path. Um, it kind of, it breaks down how to live the, within the science of yoga and a small one so i had i brought out this is um if you could see you know it's all marked up you know it's my reading and this is um and i have another one here so in light of all the stuff that's going on in our world right now i really wanted to read the, the sutras from a woman's point of view most of the sutras are written um it's ancient it, it's thousands of years old written in Sanskrit. So most of the translations, 90% of them are done by men, which excellent translation, love it. But I wanted a woman's one. So here you go, here's some resources for you people. Um, and it's one of the ones that uh, doesn't have a lot of translation underneath it. You know, some of them will have pages of what you know Patanjali was talking about. Um, this one is I am Dukam Anagatam and you know, I'm sorry for my butchering of Sanskrit. Uh, you know, it's not my thing. But what it means is um, things, pain that has yet to come might not come. Okay, meaning, and I combine the two, the what if bridge. Don't cross the bridge before you have to in the what ifs. It's the what if bridge. So my therapist had ga gave me that sutra to meditate on. And I meditated on it over and over and it really helped me to realize and help myself stop that hamster wheel in my brain of what if what if what if what if and be able to say um no you know future pain is just an illusion it's something we're creating in our mind that might not come to pass because we don't know what's coming so to perseverate on it and to to sit with it and marinate on it, all, what's the point, right? I and mean, if you think about it, all the what ifs that we've created, how many of them really came true, right? And I don't know who said this, and I wish I did, and I'm sure I'm gonna not paraphrase it right, but um, worrying is like sitting in a rocking chair. All of this activity and you go nowhere. 
And I just thought, like, that, like, the toolbox is a visual in my mind, like, get off that rocking chair, yeah. right? We don't need to be on it because all of this energy is being wasted. I'm not getting anywhere. So, yeah, so that's another, that is, that sutra is excellent because that what if bridge doesn't need to be there, you know? Yeah. So I'm sorry, I, I'm like, <laughs> tell me to be quiet. <laughs> No, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, so anyone who's watching this that lives, so I'm in Suffolk County, Long Island. I'm in Patchogue. Um, anyone who is in the local area and watching this, if they wanted to come to your class, where are you teaching now and how could they maybe get yeah. you or, you know, follow, follow whatever it is that all the great things yeah. are doing? Yeah. So, um, so on social media, I have a page, uh, Healing Through Yoga on Instagram, and Sumer for Yoga on Facebook, and I'm not the best on social media. It's, I don't know, it's not my thing. You know, I try. Um, I teach at Mr. G's Ultimate Fitness. I, I'm a gym yoga teacher. Um, I teach at Mr. G's Ultimate Fitness uh, twice a week, Sunday mornings and Tuesday mornings. And I teach at another gym three times a week. However, it is a corporation and we're not allowed to put any of that out on social media. So if you're interested, that's also three times a week. Um, you can DM me and I can say where it is. It's just a requirement of the corporation. Um, I'm also, um, I sub at Leela Family Yoga in Ronkonkoma. And I was just invited through the owner there, Dan Danny. She's wonderful. Um, I'm going to be doing part of their, I'm going to be a guest speaker on trauma-informed yoga in their teacher training. And look for, in the winter, I am going to be running a training there, a weekend training to train yoga teachers how to become trauma-informed yoga teachers. So that will be out on social media soon. Danny and I are talking about that now. And uh, yeah, and I'm going into the South Country School District with a fabulous teacher, Christine Brody, who I absolutely love, um, and to work with their teachers and their kids. And yeah, so we're, we're a busy group, the two of us. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, and, and DM me and I'll give you the whole schedule on where you can find me. I work five days a week, so I'm around, yeah. And we'll do that in the, we'll put in the comments, you know, if they want to follow you and if they want to sure. message you or whatever. And if there was anything that came up while you were watching this, you know, this Facebook live and you're watching, yeah, thing, you know, please ask questions. Both of us will be paying attention to whatever questions that come up. And, you know, if there's anything specific, you want a little bit more information or how did you do this or why did you do this? Wh whatever it is, you know, sure. reach out to Sue and ask questions. She's, she's the expert, you know, and again, it's a have Thank you. To have that ability to help people through some of the most terrible points in their life and be able to help them move past it is just such a gift that you're sharing with everyone. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, you know, being part of somebody else's recipe is part of my recipe. Like this heals me by knowing that I can make a difference for, for someone else as so many people have done for me. And it's just paying it forward. You know, it's constantly paying it forward. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm so glad we get to know each other. And if anybody puts a question, even if it's like weeks down the, down the road, let me know. And, you know, and I will to totally answer anything that comes up. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right. Well, thank you, everybody who tuned in. I know some people came in a little bit late. Hi to everybody that came in that I didn't get to say hi to. Um, yes. Hopefully we'll do another Facebook Live next week. Uh, I can't, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly I'm doing because for those of you who know me, I am very pregnant um, and probably yeah. I'm delivering in two weeks. So um, who knows what could happen in between there, but I do plan on doing a Facebook live next week, possibly even the day before, cause I'm getting a C-section. So I, if everything goes as planned, I might even be doing this up until the end. Cause you know, same wow. kind of thing, the, the ability to help other people when I, I've been there and I know how hard it can be when you feel alone and you feel like there's no way out so yeah. I really you know anything that I can do to be helpful and help you on your journey and I you know I know Sue feels the same way so thank you everybody so much for tuning in and uh, we'll see you all next week take care thank you bye, bye.